to me, the backbone of the Wing Chun system is the centerline theory. The centerline theory is viewed differently by different people. But in a nutshell, the centerline theory is the idea that there is a, an imaginary line, which is actually a plane, that cuts right through the surface of your body and right through the surface of my body and connects us core to core, like a sheet of paper between us that cuts right through the surfaces of our body. If you imagine, like, if you've ever seen any of the old American westerns, there was always the scene where both bad guys would put one end of a rag in their mouth and then they would have a knife fight. Well, that rag that they held in their teeth between them is the center line. The, the, the idea in Wing Chun then is to look at your, your block or your strike as being a pyramid with its, its tip being either the striking surface or the blocking surface. And the idea then is, in a nutshell, to try to place the tip of your attack or defense pyramid between the tip of your attacker's attack or defense pyramid and the center line. And that's when you're said to have center line advantage, so to speak. So in other words, if there's a, a line cutting between me and my opponent, and there's that center line plane between us cutting through the surfaces of our body, and his punch comes down that line, I'm looking at a pyramid with its vertex, or its apex, rather, at the knuckles. And what I then have to do is present the correct pyramid structure with its apex ending up between the tip of the opponent's uh, pyramid and the center line plane. So it's a game of inches because here I might not have it, now I might have it, now I might not have it, now I might have it. Because anything that you do deep in the opponent's territory is magnified out in your territory. So if I push his arm just an inch out here, it, it has a much greater effect out here by my face. So we try to control the center and as far forward in to enemy territory as possible. So that would be the center line theory in a nutshell. It's actually a lot more sophisticated than that. Um, but then again, once you understand it, you can forget it and just adhere to it without really thinking about all those things. You know, I don't sit there and think, oh my God, I've got to get the, you know, by the time I could even say the sentence, I've been hit. But it's built into my techniques. It's one of those sieves that I talked about that all my techniques have to filter through. They have to be center line theory compliant. Um, another very important theory or aspect of Wing Chun is the aspect of facing, the idea of facing, the way that I face my opponent. We imagine there to be a 90 degree angle emanating from the center line, from the self center line I should say, a line, a stripe painted down the front of my body. We imagine there to be a 45 on each side or a 90 degree sort of angle cut out in front of me. And that is my effective angle of facing. That's what I call my live area. And I call it that because all of my best attacks, kicks, headbutts, elbows, fall within this spectrum. All of my best defensive abilities are within the spectrum as well. It doesn't mean I can't kick behind me or headbutt behind me or elbow behind me. I can't. But my best moves are all within this spectrum. And so my best defenses also, anything that comes at me within this spectrum, I have a much better chance of blocking it with my Wing Chun motions that I've been trained to use than I would a punch coming from the back of my head. What facing does is it allows me to focus my best offensive and defensive movements at my opponent. So I always try to keep my opponent in my live area. Now, having said that, we have a dead side behind us. Everything that's not in the live area is considered the dead side. So in Wing Chun, what we try to do then is we try to keep our opponent within the live area, but we try to stay out of his live area. So if you think of yourself as almost like having a, a searchlight and you're sort of a prison guard, you always try to keep the escaped prisoner lit up. At the same time, you're an escaped prisoner. You're always trying to stay out of the opponent's light. So if you think of it that way, you're, it's a constant jockeying for facing. Now, when you have two skilled Wing Chun guys that look at facing this way, it's a skilled battle like a chess game. But if you're going against somebody on the street who's unskilled or doesn't look at facing the same way as you do, you can get an advantage of facing just with a simple step. And that's part of CRCA Wing Chun is to immediately seek the advantage of facing. And there's more to it, but not to bore you to death. Um, economy of motion is another key concept, which is the idea of taking the, the quickest route um, to, to your attacking or your defending. Now, again, there, there might be a difference that you could see between CRCA and other Wing Chun because 
most Wing Chun guys out there, and I'm not criticizing you guys, okay, so don't come after me, but most Wing Chun guys out there strive to get their moves as short and straight as possible. And in CRCA Wing Chun, I have come to recognize that the shortest distance between two points is not always the fastest. What I mean by that is the shortest distance to your car right now is to probably go through that wall right there and then uh, cut through that brick wall and jump down. It's the shortest distance, but it's not the fastest distance. The shortest distance to Paddington Station is, would be a similar thing, cutting through people's backyards and breaking down walls. But the fastest way might be to take Houston Street, but you know what, at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, that might not be the fastest way. So it's very much the same in, in Wing Chun in combat. Sometimes the shortest distance is there's an obstacle in the way, and you've got to you know, somehow get around that obstacle. And, and so there is a lot of circular movement in my Wing Chun that other people might not use. But economy of motion, then, is getting there the quickest you can and again, not necessarily the shortest, because the shortest isn't always the quickest. And I could go on and on, but let's not bore you to death with that. Timing is a crucial aspect of Wing Chun. Um, timing is, is viewed in Wing Chun as being divided into two main types, and that is self-timing and applied timing. Self-timing is the way you time your own movement, how you release your own punch in relation to you, your pivoting of your feet, your stepping, your hip, your shoulder movement, and how you release that move in time to get the maximum power and maximum speed and efficiency just within yourself. But like, almost like a ballerina, she's got to be trained in all her jumps and leaps and spins and everything else before they ever put her in with other dancers to do the Nutcracker Suite, for example. Well, a Wing Chun fighter has to be well skilled in self-timing before he can apply that timing to another fighter. So you might have the greatest self-timing in the world, releasing everything very nicely, but if your opponent throws a punch and you get tush, then your applied timing basically sucks. So what we try to do then is view timing in its applied form as, as a door. Actually, we relate it to an opening and closing door. Now, years and years back, all you guys, you old guys like me, you all have that green book that Bruce Lee wrote. Well, they say James M. Lee wrote it, but we all know Bruce Lee wrote it. And in it, he described the gates. And he said the upper gate and the lower gate and the middle gates. And it sounds very cool. It sounds very mysterious, gates. And the reason that we use those terms, gates, well, first of all, old Chinese doors used to look like saloon doors. You know, they didn't have the bottom, just the top, like the old westerns. And so the term gates is appropriate because in the old days, that's what they had, were gates rather than doors. But the term gates is used in Wing Chun exactly the same way we, in the modern day, use the term window. When we say, what's my window? You know, you watch these um, thriller burglary movies and the guy will say, what's my window? You know, well, you got 30 seconds when, while the cameras sweep this way that you could roll in, grab the diamond, roll out, and not be seen. That's your window. Well, in Wing Chun, the most opportune time to hit your opponent, again, because it's a small person's art, the most opportune time to hit your opponent is viewed as being when he's trying to hit you. That enables you to what we call jie lik, or borrow power. You can't borrow power if there's no power to be had. So the ultimate, the holy grail in Wing Chun, then, is to hit the opponent while he's trying to hit you. And that is viewed, then, as a door opening and closing. So the ability to borrow a person's power is when your opponent's doors are open. So doors are closed, doors are opening, 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 fully open, closing, closing, closed. Opening, 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 open, closing, closing, closed. So as long as you can move while your opponent's door is open, then you've used your window and you've rolled in, grabbed the diamond, and got out. And that's your window or your gate. That's your gate. We use the term gate differently in Wing Chun, or in, in, in Eng American English anyway. But it, window would have been a better, a better translation. However, door was what they used back in those days. So you think of regular timing in Wing Chun as being like a door that's opening. And you just jump in any time. You can wait. The door can just barely be open. You can jump in, wait till it's fully open and jump in, or wait till it's closing and sneak in. In any case, when your opponent's punching you, if you can smack him anywhere within that spectrum, you've used regular timing. Then we have something called breaking timing, which is the equivalent of sticking your foot in the door so all your friends can come in. 
That would be a technique in Wing Chun that would involve um, stopping the opponent's movement, holding the door open. For example, when a person punches and you use what we call tanda, which is to block and strike, what you're effectively doing is holding the door open so all your friends can come in. Then you have what we would call created timing. If there's no timing to be had, you have to create timing. In other words, in Wing Chun, we don't really like to just come out and attack someone. We really want to prompt them to do something so that we can hit them. See, we can't be sure that we can hurt this guy. If he's twice our size, you can't be 100% sure that your punch would really hurt him. But you could be sure if you could make him somehow magically step outside of his own body and hit himself, that he could hurt himself. So the idea then is, let's you and me beat up you. And so to do that, you really need power to, to be borrowed. And like a bank, you don't just give back what you borrowed, you give back a little bit more. You have to pay back more than you borrowed. Well, that's what we do in Wing Chun. By creative timing, I mean you knock on the door, and then when the guy opens the door, hello, bam! And so that would be the equivalent of doing something to his leading arm, maybe hitting his arm, slapping his hand, or somehow creating, causing him to make some kind of motion, which you can then capitalize on. Then there's uh, delayed timing and double timing. I won't go into those right now, but there are other forms of advanced timing. Um, is that enough, or do you want more? Those are the biggies. So center line, facing, economy of timing, yeah, economy of motion, yeah. We covered the main ones.